Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Uh, uh, if we have now a PowerPoint, perfect, thank you very much, um, Helen. Uh, we have now a short presentation on the results of a survey. We were approached a few months ago by a corporation called Rivi Corporation, which specializes in the production of, uh, of surveys. And they had conducted a, a survey for, for another organization, but one of the questions was related to same-sex uh, marriage. Um, we found the results of this survey very interesting because uh, um, of the number of countries they covered, 51 countries, and uh, because of the uh, random um, nature of the, of the samples, which uh, usually, you know, when you, when you find surveys uh, led by newspapers online, things like that, usually uh, it is not a genuine sample because it will be not genuinely random, whereas in this case it is. So although uh, marriage, same-sex marriage is not uh, among the top priorities of, uh, of ILGA in this moment because our top priorities remain with the differences, however, that Joseph pointed out uh, earlier on, but remain uh, universal decriminalization and universal depathologization of trans and intersex people. Nevertheless, we thought that because of the size of this uh, survey and the nature of the sample, it would have been interesting to look at it and show it and, and share it with you because uh, it is a way for us to gauge into what uh, the perception in public opinions around the world is about um, sexual or uh, non-orthodox, uh, non-normative uh, uh, sexual orientations in general. So, we present, uh, you have uh, this material in your, in your uh, package, uh, and you will uh, see that uh, the 51 countries, we have ordered them in five stripes. We have put on the first stripe uh, the countries which already have same-sex uh, marriage legislation, or those are, who are about to have it, and here, of course, we've put Ireland, Angus, and uh, rest assured, we think the referendum is going to go pretty well uh, <laughs> on this weekend. And you can see, we, well, the color coding of, of, uh, that you see is, uh, if you see a dark green, it means that the yeses are more than 50%. Light green, the yes are a majority, but less than 50%. Yellow, it's where you have close proximity between yes and no's. Uh, orange is less than 50% uh, for the no's, and red is where the no to same-sex marriage uh, are more than 50%. And you can see that in this, in this part, we have only two uh, uh, things to point out. France, where yes and no's are, uh, there's only one point of percentage difference, and France already has same-sex legislation. In South Africa, which uh, was the fourth country in the world to adopt same-sex marriage, and nevertheless, you have 50%, which is against. Then, the next slide. The next row is the countries which have uh, not marriage, but either civil partnership or, or similar provisions with uh, maybe a little bit less rights than same-sex marriage. And here you see uh, interestingly, Ecuador has a, a high percentage of the population against same-sex marriage. Um, whereas, uh, you will, it will be interesting to see here, Brazil, for instance, has 4% between yes and no's. Israel, you have uh, the 2% uh, uh, of no's are more than the yeses. And Italy, which has nothing yet, but uh, they are uh, about to have a discussion in the parliament about a bill, the yeses are more than the noes, although by 4%. In the next slide, you have countries which have no, uh, no legislation in, in relation to couples. Um, you find only basically that uh, China, Japan, and South Korea uh, have uh, 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 less, 4% uh, or less of distance between the yeses and noes. And in the next group of countries, which mostly are uh, incidentally also are listed among those, uh, which incidentally are also have uh, criminalization laws for same-sex 
sexual activities among consenting adults. Um, you will find here, uh, we found this very interesting. If you take Russia and uh, Ukraine, uh, which was in the, in the slide before, and compare it with Egypt and Saudi Arabia, you will find that in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, the yeses for same-sex marriage are higher, a higher percentage than in Russia and Ukraine, uh, despite the fact that the four countries share the same kind of, of uh, percentage of the population accessing uh, internet. So it's not a matter of one of these countries having an elite uh, which only has access. All the countries have the same kind of, uh, of access to the internet. Um, and I'm told by Russian friends that uh, uh, the result of Russia was not the case 10 years ago. I mean, there has been a worsening. Uh, 10 years ago, there was about a third of the population in favor of same-sex marriage. So this is perhaps, in the case of Russia, a, a warring signal of the fact that this insistence of a, on an anti-propaganda law, etc., has fomented and maintain the homophobia that wasn't as strong uh, 10 years ago. In the last slide, uh, again, you will see uh, different kind of percentages, but, uh, uh, well, unfortunately, you will not see percentage of yeses to marriage in countries which have a criminalizing legislation. So this is at least the universal uh, data. Um, you will now see a greetings by the president of uh, Rivia Corporation who shared this result with us. And for us it was an interesting experience because what we hope is in the future to find partners to have, uh, to make more of these surveys on more aspect about uh, the perceptions in the, public, in the population on uh, issues related to sexual orientations and gender identity and expression. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Eric Merkamper. I'm the president of the Riri Corporation, and we are pleased to be a part of this initiative and to partner with, with ILGA. On releasing this new information, this new data from a global study looking at perceptions of same-sex marriage. Uh, this, as far as we know, is the largest study ever of its kind. We captured over 51,000 opinions from people from 51 countries uh, around the world. And we asked specifically around should same-sex marriage be legal. We uh, used an innovative technology that uh, RIWI has developed, it's called RDIT, Random Domain Intercept Technology, and with it uh, we're able to intercept people on the internet, in any country in the world, and ask them short questions. Why this is important is one thing we're randomly be able to get people who otherwise would probably never really participate in research, so it increases the number of people who have a citizen voice who can speak to this. The other thing is it's uh, anonymous, so specifically for issues like this, any social issues or sensitive issues, it allows them to speak freely. Uh, we've applied this for many different social organizations and issues around the world. We find it provides a, a, a unique vision, a unique uh, voice. Some of the findings you might find surprising, and others are confirming of probably things that we already know. And with the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, uh, we hope that's the beginning. We hope that it provides some information and is the base to further explore this issue and related issues. We know it is a part of it, but we're looking for other people to help out, look for other partners to come on board as we further understand these issues. And we're just pleased to have been a part of it, and we continue to look forward to supporting this initiative going forward. So have a great day, and thank you again. Um. You have a microphone in front of you, so if you would like to put a, a, a question to one of the panelists or more of the panelists, you are, of course, welcome. Hi, John Fisher with Human Rights Watch, and uh, I thought I'd just get the ball rolling by, really, by thanking Ilga very much for hosting this panel. I know it's become an annual event, and really the, the report that you produce has been instrumental, I think, to, to all of our advocacy efforts and also to better understand the, the world situation. So congratulations also to, to Angus and the authors for, uh, for the excellent uh, research that's gone into this, uh, to the OHHR, which I know has been working very, very hard on, on these issues, and of course to the ambassador of Brazil and the ambassadors and, uh, and delegations of the uh, the other states, Chile, Colombia, and Uruguay, which played such a, an enormous leadership role in bringing forward the, the resolution successfully adopted at the, at the Human Rights Council uh, last, last year. I think um, 
while the report is a, a sobering look at the many challenges still faced by members of the LGBTI communities around the world. Uh, it's also, I think, an opportunity to reflect on, as the panelists have said, some of the progress that we have seen. And that is reflected, I think, in the strong margin of victory and the increasing support for the resolution adopted by the Human Rights Council. So we certainly encourage the, the continued attention by all of these uh, stakeholders. Uh, I think uh, we, we feel it is time to see these issues, which are systemic issues and systemic concerns addressed and picked up by the United Nations in a, in a systemic way, and we hope that to see that reflected in uh, future reports uh, and, re and resolutions as it moves through the UN system. Um, and I guess one, uh, one potential question for, for the panelists is, is also specifically on issues of, of gender identity and intersex status. Um, how, what more can be done to see these uh, given increased attention through, for example, the, the UPR reporting and at the state level? Uh, I think we have seen uh, issues of sexual orientation better understood and integrated throughout, uh, throughout the work of, of state civil society and, and the UN. But we still notice that I think, particularly in the UPR, for example, recommendations around gender identity and intersex status uh, continue to, uh, to not be picked up and receive the attention that they deserve. So again, congrats, congratulations to everybody. Thank you for the, for the great work, and we look forward to, to supporting that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Who would like to address this question? Uh, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this important question, because I think you are right. The UPR is really a very important tool in uh, basically looking at state practice in this area and the fact that you have so many countries, 76 you say, who have really discriminatory laws and particularly, particularly in, the, in criminal laws, criminal laws that basically at the end people get punished because of their sexual orientation, I think is really very, very important angle. Now, uh, I think it's very important that we, uh, uh, that there are specific recommendations that are made and really that we have uh, a good understanding of, as you know, states have to accept these recommendations and basically work with these states so that these legal frameworks that basically persecute people at the end of the day are tackled uh, uh, genuinely. I like what you just said, and actually this is an important, uh, uh, Joseph, what you actually mentioned about the responsibility to protect. I think, frankly, when you look at the history of really looking at the, crimi the cr criminal law aspects to deal with persecution is really an important aspect of uh, our work. And I remember very well, even when there was a discussion about about the meaning of persecution with regard to the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, the issue of gender discrimination and sexual orientation was very much on the agenda already in 98. So already long time ago, we've been thinking in this way, but we haven't really implemented a lot in this area. So clearly we need to be a lot more aware of the issues and push in the right direction. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Andre? It's not so much a, a question. I'm Andre. I work at ILGA. I think I know most of you here. Um, but I think just to highlight um, two events that are coming up, um, which I just wanted to highlight. Well, maybe three events, actually. Um, so first of all, thank you, Ambassador um, Dunlop, for mentioning what you, together with uh, Chile and Uruguay and Colombia, will be uh, holding this, this event, and I'm sure we'll all be looking very much forward to being in there and, and working towards what are the next steps towards uh, future work at this council. Um, a, a second event that I want to mention is, of course, we, we've talked about um, IDAHOT um, next week in Geneva, um, the International uh, HIV and AIDS Alliance is holding an event, um, and I just want to highlight to people here, uh, on Tuesday the 19th of May from 1 p.m. until 3 p.m., um, leaving no one behind, ensuring universal health coverage and the end to AIDS for marginalized and key populations. Um, for those of you who, who, we follow a lot of stuff in the human rights framework, but the health framework is an equally important one for many of our population groups, many of our member organizations as well. Um, if people want details about that, please come and see me afterwards. Um, the, the, the third event I think I wanted to mention um, was that, again, we're coming up to the, the Human Rights Council um, itself. And ILGA 
um, we'll be holding a, a side event during um, the Human Rights Council, uh, probably in the first week, uh, on specifically the issue of, of, of children. Um, and we're so glad today to see this strong statement by many special procedures, by the Committee on the Rights of the Child, by the, um, the UN uh, Special Representative on Violence Against Children and, and others, and the, the, the regional groups, I think, is particularly important that this is, again, not just something that's happening in Geneva, but the African Commission the, uh, in the Americas um, and also the Council of Europe. Um, so for us, it's a very important um, area, and we will be, we're not, we don't have a date yet, but certainly if you've signed up um, for today on the piece of paper that's gone around, we'll make sure that you're kept informed um, about that, um, that's going ahead. I think that's enough, the three events will, uh, will be enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, for uh, uh, reminding us all of these uh, three coming events. Uh, I would suggest now, considering also the time, that we can uh, abandon this room and have uh, uh, drinks together outside. Yeah. Uh, we, well, we hope to, um, that uh, the report serves us as a as a tool in the in the in the course of the next 12 months, and that hopefully we can meet again in, in a year and uh, uh, celebrate, if not uh, uh, more uh, advances in terms of legislation, but at least in terms of the concrete uh, uh, well-being of uh, uh, people of all sexual orientation and gender identities and expression on the ground. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.